Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How'd your reading go this week? It's a lot more exciting stuff now, isn't it? Yeah. More stuff going on, although uh, we got a little bit bogged down, I guess, in the uh, parceling out of the land. Did everybody get out your map and follow all those places? The problem is a lot of those places have a little question mark after them because we don't know where they are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sometimes that gets a little tough. But if you do get out a map of, like in this case, the, the division of the 12 tribes, it's going to show you some approximate boundaries, and those are fairly accurate. Okay, so that's a good thing. Uh, we're going to you're going to go back right over the same territory again in the coming week as you read through the book of Judges, because guess what? All the stuff in the book of Judges happens in those same places. Okay, so a, a, a map right now is going to really, really be helpful in terms of understanding what it is you're reading. <coughs> Have you noticed that the world is always on the lookout for heroes? Have you ever noticed that? Now, most of the people that get um, held up as heroes, especially ball players and the like, um, don't want to be considered heroes. Guys, could you turn on this other projector, please? Thanks. Um, they, they'll tell you, I'm not a hero, I'm just a ball player. But whether they want to be a hero or not, especially the kids are going to look up to them, right? <coughs> Unfortunately, far too often, the heroes that we choose really are not worthy of the honor of being called hero. Uh, too often our heroes are not worthy of the adulation or the worship that receive. And, and oftentimes, unfortunately, Many of the people that sort of get held up as heroes are, are really more notorious than they are noteworthy, right? Uh, you know, because you know who the, who the rapper is and the gangster rapper, you know, all of that stuff that goes on. And we go, wow, you know, really? I think what it is maybe is that too often the people that get touted as heroes are popular, but they're really not significant. I believe, though, that heroes, those people that we can look up to, are something that every one of us needs. We need real heroes. Uh, some of the ones that get held up that way aren't, but, but we need them. We need to be challenged in our faith. We need to be prodded in our laziness. We need to be confronted in our bad habits. We need to be spurred on in our neglect. And real heroes, God heroes, can do that for us. Israel was a people who loved their heroes. The Bible, the Old Testament, the stuff we've been reading, is a book that's filled with heroes along with some villains. Have you noticed that? But it's the heroes that were revered by the people of Israel. Uh, the writer of Hebrews, in uh, reminding his fellow Jews of their faith heritage, in chapter 11, are we familiar with chapter 11 in Hebrews? Anybody read that? We aren't there yet in our reading this year, but, but there's, a, there's a partial list there of those heroes of the faith, right? But you know what? Those weren't just for the Jews. They could be our heroes too, right? I mean, the people that that writer the book of Hebrews was writing to knew about Abraham. He, there isn't the whole history there. It's a reminder, right? Because they already knew about Abraham. Not just the father of his people, but an adventurer, an explorer, a warrior, a spiritual leader of his growing family. I mean, Jewish children had heard the story of Father Abraham and his great victory over the five kings led by Kedor Loramer, if I could say that. Down there at Sodom, remember? Right around the Dead Sea, and some of them fell in the pits and all that stuff. That story, they already knew that story. And as the writer of Hebrews reflects back on Jewish history for his readers, he reminds them that for over 1,500 years, they as children had heard that story. 
over and over again, passed down, read out of the, the, old, the old scrolls that they had for a Bible. And they knew that story about Abraham. The people of Israel, all the way down through history, were well versed in the stories of the heroes of their people. They knew the many, many stories about Moses. And you know what? They didn't feel a bit bad that Moses had killed that Egyptian. Okay? You know, the one that was beating up on the Hebrew. They didn't feel bad. That made him a hero in their eyes. I mean, it was... That was a good thing. They knew the stories of Joshua and the conquest of their homeland that we've been reading about this week. They knew about the hero judges. They didn't get tired of, of hearing about Samson and Ehud and Deborah and Gideon, the stories we're going to be reading next week. They didn't get tired of that. They knew the mighty men of David that we'll be reading about in a few weeks. Uh, they're listed in 2 Samuel 22. I wonder, you, ever, did, you know who I'm talking about? The three... And the 30, you know, uh, did they have the equivalent of baseball cards? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, they were held up in high regard historically as well as at the time that they lived. They knew about Josheb and Eleazar and Shema. They knew that Josheb's nickname was Adino the Esnite because he'd killed 800 enemies single-handed. That was a tough dude because they didn't have guns back then, right? Strong man. So, you know, we could come all the way even down to the time of Jesus, if you like, to the apostles who were, man, they were, those were their heroes too, right? It didn't matter that a thousand years had passed since the great deeds of David had been performed. They still knew about the hero, heroes. The people still remembered that Abishai, the brother of Joab, was the captain of the 30, that he, he made it into the Hall of Fame, right? He was as good, not quite as good, I should say, as the three, but, but he was pretty well up there. They knew the names of the hero, heroes and the mighty deeds that they've performed. And we've been reading about some of those heroes over the past 12 weeks, and we're going to continue on with some more reading in our Old Testament. This morning, though, I want to look at one of those particular people from our text here in Joshua chapter 14. And the sons of Judah came near to Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word that Jehovah spoke to Moses, the man of God, to me and to you in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of Jehovah, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him back word as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me caused the heart of the people to melt. Yet I fully followed after Jehovah my God. And Moses swore in that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has walked shall be an inheritance for you and for your sons forever, because you have fully followed after Jehovah my God. And now, behold, Jehovah has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years since Jehovah spoke his, this word to Moses, when Israel was in the wilderness. And now, behold, today I am 85 years old, yet I am as strong today as in the day Moses sent me. You know who I always think of when I read this passage? Ed Felkley. Ed Felkley. When Ed Felkley was 75 years old, he had guns that make me envious, you know? Uh, you know, guns. Biceps. Um, da -da -da. As my strength was then, so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. And now, give me this mountain of which Jehovah spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the sons of Anak were there, and great walled cities. If Jehovah will be with me, then I shall dispossess them as Jehovah has spoken. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron has belonged to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, for an inheritance to this day, because he, you notice know this phrase keeps coming up? Because he fully followed after Jehovah, the God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was the city of Arba, because Arba was a great man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. 
Ah, uh, Caleb. Do you like Caleb? Isn't he, isn't he quite the character? He was a different kind of man. That phrase that kept coming up over and over again there, fully followed Jehovah his God. I said it four times if I remember. I didn't count them. But uh, fully, it, it made him a different kind of man. A man who, in my mind, stands maybe even above the three, the mighty men of David. They gained renown fighting with the group especially before David becomes king, those guys banded together and they would take on pretty much anybody. But here's Caleb who was the man and way, way above the 600,000 men of war. Standing far for a few minutes this morning. A man of God whose heart stood strong in faith despite the circumstances and the people that seemed determined to take his heart away from God. What was there about Caleb that made him different? Well, first of all, Caleb had a different spirit. I want to back up. We want to look because we first run into Caleb in Numbers chapter 13. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago about that hard time when the children of Israel had refused to go in and how hard that was on Moses and ultimately how hard it was on the people. But I want to back up there and I want to look at Caleb and compare him to his contemporaries because there were things that they did that were just absolute failures. There were things that Caleb did that made him very successful in God's eyes, which is where it counted. But let's look first. Here, here is the roster of the spies. Okay, we know there's 12 men, 12 men went to spy out Canaan. 10 were bad and two were good, right? Do you remember the old song? That, did the kids still sing that one? Yeah. Here's the roster. And I want us to look at the names of the spies. And here's what it says. Now these were their names. Of the tribe of Reuben, Shemua. Sounds like a whale from San Diego, doesn't it? Shemua, the son of Zachar of the tribe of Simeon. Uh, I'm sorry, I read it wrong. Of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Of the tribe of Issachar, Igal, the son of Joseph. Of the tribe of Ephraim, Joshua, the son of Nun. Of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodai, of the tribe of Joseph, of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadai, the son of Susi, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamale, of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael, of the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vophsi, I guess, hmm. Of the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Maki, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent out to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So, so there they are. You know, we got Shemua, Shephat, Caleb, Igli. You know, all these different people. And yet, when you look at the list, how many names do we really know out of that list? Two. Just two. Joshua and Caleb. The rest of those guys... This didn't quite make the grade. We don't spend any time remembering them. Joshua and Caleb stand out, and we have a memory of them. Of course, Joshua worked closely with Moses as an assistant and finally as leader in his place. And the other, Caleb, though he was not chosen to lead the nation, he still is a leader of his people, and he stands out in such a, just a magnificent way because of who he was. And so they had a mission. Oop, I'm ahead of myself, aren't I? Okay, sorry. They had a mission. And it, in number, Numbers chapter 13, verse 17, it says this, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said to them, You go up this way into the Negev, and go up into the hills, and you shall see the land, what it is, and the people who are living on it, whether it is strong or feeble, whether it is few or many, and what the land is in which they live, whether good or bad. And what are the cities? in which they live. There we go. 
Whether in camps or in fortresses, and what is the land, what the land is, excuse me, whether it is fat or lean, whether wood is in it or not, and you shall make yourself strong and shall take of the fruit of the land. And it was the days of the first ripe grapes. So the mission is go up there, spend time walking up and down in the hills, looking down on the valleys, spying out the land, and bring us back an accurate report. You know, is there are there trees? Are there farms? Are there, you know, is there produce up there? How, how are they defended? Is, are there cities? Or are they people just live in open camps, etc., etc., etc.? Pretty straightforward, right? Pretty simple thing to do. Uh, somehow it got complicated in the process. So what did they do? They, did, they took the trip, right? And they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob, coming to Hamath, and they turned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days. And so they did it. They went up and they did it. That, you know, I don't know how 12 guys snuck around that long and didn't get caught, but they did. And they did a very thorough job. In fact, uh, they end up, what the, one of the notable things that the text says is that they found this cluster of grapes that was so big, they hung it on a pole and slung it between two guys and brought it back. But it was so notable to them, they go, man, we got to take that back, show everybody. And they did. In fact, Eshkol means the cluster, and that they named the valley, the Valley of Eshkol, after that cluster of grapes. And the report, well, the report really was pretty accurate. They explained everything they saw. Yeah, we saw walled cities, and, and we saw this, and we saw that. So, there we go. And they reported to him and said, We came to the land where you sent us, and indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. Um, how did they know that it was supposed to flow with milk and honey? God told them, right? Said, that's what's there. That's what you're going to find. By the way, do you know that there's been an argument among theologians and Bible scholars about whether there was actually honey in the land when they went there? Oh, yeah. No. The whole treatises were written that if there really wasn't honey, but there was this goo that you squeeze out of dates, and, and it's called date honey, and so it was date honey. You know, I was privileged last year to hear a presentation by a man who was excavating over in Israel. And you know what he found? He found an apiary inside of a building. Beehives. They're round tubes about that big around, about this long, out of unfired clay pipes. And the building had collapsed, but enough of what was left, they found the bee carcasses inside. And, it, you know, he's not... Uh, I wouldn't call him a godly man. He's an Israeli and he believes the Bible to the degree that you get geography out of it. But it was almost like he was astounded that, yeah, there really were bees. Well, no kidding. Clear back here, it said they were going to find what? Milk and honey. There's going to be animals that provide milk and there's going to be bees that provide honey. I, I, you know, I just, you just listen to that kind of stuff and it just boggles your mind. And you know, of course, what he found out, by the way, here I am off of my archaeology stuff. He found out once they figured out what they had, they started looking around. You know, the people in that part of the world still have beehives that look exactly like the ones he found that were 3,000 years old. They make them out of plastic pipes now, but they're round and they stack them up in a row. So, I don't know. Let's just believe the Bible. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the key there. Anyway, milk and honey. And this is its fruit, but the people that live in the land are fierce and the cities are walled up very great. And also we have seen the children of Anak there. Of course, the children of Anak were, were giants. That's, uh, that's the reference there, although it doesn't say it right here. So, <clears throat> they gave a report. And the report was accurate in one sense, in that they stated facts. But their report was also very effective for the enemy. Because though there were walled cities and they did see big people and they, all the stuff they said was true, it was where they put the emphasis that made all the difference, right? Were all the cities walled? Were all the cities filled with great big giant people? No, that part wasn't true. But they emphasized the bad in order to sway public opinion. 
It reminds me, do you remember during the first Gulf War? Some of you are too young to remember it, but I still remember it. They had these people, they called them embedded reporters. They would put reporters with the troops and send them out there. And they couldn't tell you where they were or who exactly they were with, but they could make these reports from the field. And they were constantly emphasizing the negative, minimizing the positive, promoting the shortcut in Cummings, and hiding bravery and hardiness and courage. That's just the way they did it. And I thought, man, that, here we have this. This is the same kind of thing, that there were good things there. There were things that, that Moses wanted to know about that were supposed to encourage the people. Instead, they come back and say, you wouldn't believe. There's honey, but the bees have stingers three feet long. That would be the, you know, that's the equivalent. You know, you're going to die if you try to get the honey. And the cows, oh, they're longhorns. They're from Texas. They're going to gore you if you try to get the milk. That, that was the sort of presentation that they made to discourage their brothers and sisters. They told the truth, but emphasized the imaginary pitfalls as well as the most negative aspects of what they'd seen. And it really boiled down, they didn't want to go and try. God told them to. They understood the positives, but they didn't want to go and try. And of course, the reaction was what? People rebelled. They wanted to stone Moses and Joshua and Aaron and everybody else. Let's read the next piece here. Back to Caleb. I had to set all that background up because we really didn't talk about that part when we came through Numbers. Okay, here we are, Numbers 13, 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, We will certainly go up and we will seize it for we are well able to do it. Now I find it interesting that it's Caleb alone who stands up and says this. I wonder if Joshua maybe was wobbling a little bit here. Now, a little farther on, we find Caleb and Joshua stand shoulder to shoulder and, and uh, stand up for God. But in this case, it's Caleb somehow alone who says, no, 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 you know. I, I don't know. This is where I see Caleb just a different spirit. I mean, Caleb is the crew cut in the sea of green and red mohawk haircuts. You know what I'm saying? Remember when those were popular a while back? And, and he's the guy that, you know, just got the buzz cut. What Caleb does, what he says, runs counter to the culture in which he's existing. The pressure was on to give a report that was at odds with the truth, or at least emphasizing the negative in order to discourage Moses and the people from doing something, though it was difficult, was very possible. God said it was possible. God said that land is ready. And it wouldn't go up. I have a video I want to show one of these days. It's called 1177 BC. And it talks about all the stuff that's been going on in this whole region before the children of Israel come out of Egypt. And you know one of the things that had happened is that there had been earthquakes, famines, wars, um, something else, volcanoes, all kinds of stuff were going on. And the populations were decimated, and especially the whole central part of what now is Israel was empty. There was nobody there. And God says, I want you to go up in there and take it over. I've got it ready for you. See? And they said, we're, we're just tiny and we can't do that. <laughs> you know, I'm scared. The lying report. Last part of this first one here. And they sent out an evil report of the land which they had spied out to the sons of Israel saying, so this is these men going back to their individual tribes and spreading this around. The land into which we passed to spy it out is a land eating up the ones living in it. Really? So I told you, bees with two foot stingers, right? eating up the ones living in it. All the people we saw, all you notice this, all the people we saw in, in its midst were men of stature. And we saw giants there, the sons of Anak of the giants. And here's the one true statement they make out of all this. And we were in our own eyes as grasshoppers. 
Isn't that the problem right there? That summarizes it right there. And so we were in their eyes. The thing that stopped the children of Israel from going into the promised land was the fear, uh, the negativity, the lack of faith, the discouraging words of ten men who were scared and determined not to go. They viewed themselves as grasshoppers, without power, without ability, without hope. And of course, ultimately, the bottom line, what was driving it all, without faith in God. And they were able to infect the majority of the people so that they turned against Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. Caleb and most of all, they turned against God and against what God had told them to do. And it was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. Caleb had a different spirit. And when we contrast him with everything else that's going on with all these thousands of people, wow, he just stands out. He stands out from the crowd. He had a different spirit. Second thing this morning, Caleb had a heart to fully follow God. And I emphasize that as we read the passage this morning. When we fast forward 45 years, so we have Caleb's 40 when they go to spy out the land. They wandered around in the wilderness 40 years, right? Now they've had five years or thereabouts where they're traveling toward the land. They have all the battles on the east side of the Jordan River, the Transjordan, where they kick out the Amorites as God had told them to do. They actually give land back to Ammon, the, 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 one of the tribes that was descended from Lot. And then finally, they cross over the Jordan. And here we are now, we're 45 years after Kadesh Barnea. And of course, what's happened in the intervening 12 years, 10, or 40 years, 45 years, sorry, is that the 10 spies are dead, right? Along with everybody else who was 20 years old or older, at the time that that report was given to the people and they believed it. I mean, here they are, their rationale for not going in is what? They're afraid they're going to die, right? And what happens to them in the wilderness? They die. Uh, mm, ah, let's think about this. The result was the same in the end, right? And of course, by this time, even Moses, the lawgiver, and the leader is dead. And only Caleb and Joshua, all of God's leaders, have survived God's punishment and actually crossed the Jordan River and entered the Promised Land. And in fact, Caleb has participated in the battles and the wars that's preceded this time as they entered the land. Okay, so, what is it about Caleb that makes him different, right? He had a heart to fully follow God and he was willing to follow a path of faithfulness even when nobody else could see it. Isn't that what was going on? Everybody else had an idea of what they should do. And Caleb's got this laser focus of there's the path. That's what God told me to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Because he was fully committed to following Jehovah as God. Others would choose different paths. Caleb consistently chose a path that was close to God. <clears throat> Even in the face of danger to himself and danger to his family, he chose the path that was close to God. Let's read these verses here. This is from Joshua 14, verse 7 to 8. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of Jehovah, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him back word as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me caused the heart of the people to met, melt, yet I fully followed after Jehovah my God. Caleb was just not willing to settle for some kind of partial service to God or some kind of lip service or some kind of sort of, you know, nominal religion. He said, I fully followed. I fully followed what Jehovah God wanted me to do. Um, <clears throat> this is sort of, Premonicent, if I can make up another word, I like to do that. Jesus in Luke 9.62 said this, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And he could have been talking about Caleb. That Caleb got himself started and he said, This is what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it. 
and he did. It didn't mean that it was an easy path. In fact, for Caleb, it was never the easy path. <clears throat> uh, Caleb was one who had a lot of difficulties from his relatives, all those other people that had the bad reports. And when they got into the land, do we really realize the, what Caleb was asking for? He wanted to go and he said, I want the land that I walked on because that's what Noah, or no, that's what Moses had promised him. But he was asking for the area where the giants lived. Remember, they all got a scared, we're like grasshoppers, right? And he said, I want to go up there. That's where I want to go. And it was up in the high ground. It was in the Shvala, which is the foothills. It wasn't up into the mountains yet, but it was, it was high ground. There were walled cities there. There was desert terrain you had to go through to get there. It's not well watered down there. And of course, back to the bottom line is there was giants there, right? And yet that was, the, that was what Caleb said that he wanted, even though here he is, he's 85 years old. Number three, Caleb received a great reward. The reward was not speedy in coming. Um, you know, I don't know. Did, did Caleb ever got a bad attitude toward his fellow wanderers in the desert? You guys, we could have been in there 40 years ago. What are you doing, you know? I, I, I don't know what way. I mean, there's things that go through our heads, right? Especially when you're 37 years into baked manna every night for dinner, you know? But I, I don't know what went through his head, but it certainly wasn't anything to do with instant gratification. And we live in an instant gratification world, don't we? What do you mean I can't download it? I have to order a what? I have to get in, in the mail, snail mail? Really? Are you kidding me, right? Isn't that kind of how we look at life nowadays? And, you know, the, the reward that he's looking for certainly wasn't evident in the approval of his contemporaries. They wanted to kill him for even suggesting that they go into the land. And yet the reward was there. The reward was waiting. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That kind of describes Caleb, doesn't it? Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way that persecuted the prophets who were before you. Serving God has never been about instant gratification. It's never been about, ooh, tomorrow I get my bass boat because God's going to give me extra money, you know? It's just not about that. And I don't care how many people on television say it is. Did you notice this week, what's that guy's name? Somebody Dollar, a preacher named Dollar, yes. Creflo, Creflo, something like that. He's asking for $65 million because he needs a private jet to go do his mission work. Really? Re I'm sorry, Caleb, you missed the boat, bud. Should have been asking for that $65 million instead of going on that 40-year trip, you know? I, I don't know. It's crazy. It's crazy what people hold up as being true religion nowadays, but it wasn't for Caleb. Caleb received a great reward, but the principles that Jesus states here in the Sermon on the Mount were not what we are seeing in our day and time. Rewards are not instant. Rewards often come at very high cost. And rewards usually have nothing to do with money or fame or comfort or whatever. It just isn't that it just isn't there. It's not in the Bible. The wait for the wait for the reward did not make Caleb bitter as far as we can tell. When he gets there he doesn't complain that he's now 85 years old and almost ready to die before he finally gets to go fight for his city that he wants. He just states it as a fact. This is where I am. This is what Moses said. I still want it, even though it's 45 years late. Caleb never lost sight of his goals. As they're going out through the wilderness, I just have to believe that others were marching toward their death and Caleb was dreaming of the hill country. That's what kept him going. That's what Moses promised. I'm, I'm going to keep going on this journey until we finally get there. And when the sons of Israel cried to Jehovah, Jehovah raised up a deliverer to the sons of... Oh, 
I got that out, out of order. Sorry. Let me, let me talk about this for a second, then I'm going to read this. There was an even better reward for, for Caleb than even what he received in his lifetime. And that is that he was such an example of faithfulness that his nephew is going to show up in our reading in Judges. So this is from Judges chapter 3. It says this, And when the sons of Israel cried to Jehovah, Jehovah raised up a deliverer to the sons of Israel, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. So Caleb and his relatives went up and they took the, the cities. They weren't named Hebron. They were, actually, Hebron is the name of one of another of uh, Caleb's relatives that they named the city after him. And three generations, excuse me, two generations later, those people are still being faithful to God. You think Caleb was having an impact on his family? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure seems like it. Not just his children, but his, but his uh, more distant relatives, in this case his brother's son, still having an impact that he's, this man is faithful and God puts him into service as, as a judge. Let me finish reading this. And the spirit of Jehovah was put on him and he judged Israel and he went out to war and Jehovah gave Chushan Rishathim, the king of Mesopotamia, into his hand and his hand had power over Chushan Rishathim and the rest of the, the land had rest for 40 years. This had to be the best reward. This is Caleb now sitting, as Hebrews tells us, among the great multitude of witnesses and watching, not a degradation into to apostasy and, and idol worship, but one of his young relatives taking over and being the deliverer for his people in the future. Caleb was a hero, is a hero, or, or should be a hero at any rate. Uh, he needs to be one of those people who's so different that he catches our eye and holds our interests and causes us to want to follow his example. We live in a society and a culture that has all kinds of individuals just wanting to stand out from the crowd. Um, I remember I was riding the train one day, it's been about Ten years ago, so it's sort of ancient history. I'm riding the train, and this guy gets on the train, never seen him before, and you get most of the people on the train ride it all the time, so you know who they are. You see the same people over and over. This guy got on and he was different. That poor fellow had more metal stuck in his face than the grill of a 56 beauty. I'm telling you, he had things stuck all over him. And I rode the train with this guy who was pretty outspoken. He'd pretty much say whatever came to his mind. And he looks at this guy, and he doesn't say anything. Then he looks at him again. About the third time he looked at him, he goes, what happened to you? You know? But that's the culture we live in, that people are trying to do stuff to stand out. But you know what? If everybody in your group has an orange mohawk and a tongue stud and has leather wristbands and baggy shorts, it's sort of hard to stand out from the crowd because everybody looks the same. You know, if everybody in your group has high-heeled boots, a white hat, a pickup truck, blue jeans, and a shirt with shiny buttons, it's, it's just hard to stand out from the group because your group all looks the same. Uh, you know, if everybody's car has the pirate skull in the back window and a Raider Nation bumper sticker, it's, it's just hard to have a unique-looking vehicle. That's no, no, it's okay. You, if you've got a Raider bumper sticker, you and Bobby, that's okay. I don't mean it that way, but I'm just saying, if there's enough people that do anything, you don't stand out anymore. We as a society, as a culture, have been a culture of fads. I mean, from rumble seats to hula hoops to pet rocks. I mean, we just have chased after fads as a culture. From email to text to Facebook to Hulu to Vimeo. What's the newest one? It's got to be a new one. It's going to put all of them out of business. Then there's some, I heard Instagram. some. Instagram, is that the newest one? I don't know. But anyway, they're all fads. And people go, whoo, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do that, right? We're still a culture of fads. We are not, though, far different from the men, women, and children of the age when Israel was leaving Egypt to carve out a territory for themselves in the land that we now know as Israel. They had fads. There was a fad of worshiping idols. It happened all over the place, right? Everybody had their idols. And of course, on the, in the process of moving, 
Aaron, the designated priest of Jehovah God, made the idol and led the people to worship the idol and said, this is Jehovah that led you out of Egypt. Because they're following a fad. The fad was to grumble about anything and everything. And Moses' sister and Aaron's sons led the group in grumbling. But of course, fire came from God and until, until Moses prayed for God to end it. The fad was to speak against Moses and the leadership that was exerting leadership activities on the group. And of course, God opened the ground and the grumbling faction got swallowed up. What I'd like to take away from thinking about Caleb this morning is this. Caleb didn't stand out from the crowd by following the fad and being part of the crowd. He stood out because he was willing to fully follow Jehovah his God. All the rest of Israel was willing to follow God fully when it was convenient or it was popular or it was easy or they were scared to death. The rest of the time, they wanted to fully follow the fad of the moment, whatever that fad happened to be. Our lesson, our choice, our decision, 3,500 years later, is the same choice that Caleb faced. Fad or faithfulness? Are we willing to buck the popular trend? Are we willing to be independent of popular opinion in the service of God? And while Israel trended from periods of great devotion to God toward absolute degradation Caleb was one of the two mighty rocks in the stream of corruption and fear things flowed around them but it didn't move them the trend in Caleb's time was away from God toward self you know what our time really isn't any different it isn't people are still people thousands of years later we still sort of act the same we react the same way to the same kinds of stimuli. And we can make the choice. I follow the fad, or do I remain faithful to God? We can be the boulder in the stream, or we can be the flotsam on top of the water, just kind of floating along with the crowd. That's really our choice. And hopefully we can look at a man like Caleb and just be encouraged to do the right thing. Can't we? I mean, is he stimulating? I hope so. Here's a blessing here for us from God's word. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. Amen? Amen.